afternoon to anyone that may be watching live this afternoon or if you're watching in a recorded version at some later point. I've got it, got it on. You see anything? All right, we've got a green light from the tech department. <laughs> we are ready to go. Well, you, uh, I think anybody might agree that uh, these are, you know, somewhat challenging times that we're living in. Of course, you know, I guess you, as you look back through history, people would always say, well, they're living in challenging times, right? Um, but I think uh, we'd, we'd also agree that some times are more challenging than others. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about... Uh, the comments that uh, <clears throat> were being made a little bit earlier about the congregations in Kenya and Belize and our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. And, you know, if we were to be transplanted into the world they live in, I'm sure we would think we were in very challenging times. And, and, and they may not think they're in such challenging times after all, you know. Uh, where they're at so it's all about your perspective and the things that you're facing and dealing with and and what you're used to but nonetheless I I think we would all be in agreement again that you know we're coming out of what was a pretty wild year in the year 2020 uh, you know we had the virus come sweep around the world um, and then we had all the lockdown situations and if you didn't have COVID you know somebody that's had COVID um, at this point, uh, but um, you know we're we're just now getting into a new year, and I'm sure we're all glad to see 2020 say goodbye and see it in the rearview mirror. <clears throat> Hopefully, we're looking out for better things in this new year, but I'd say the jury's still out on how things are going to go. <laughs> you know, it seems kind of shaky to me so far. You know. The vaccines are rolling out, but you know, in some places you hear that there might be a little problem with the vaccines, who knows? Um, you know, lockdown's still in places in some areas. Um, but even more concerning than that, we see that some of our basic liberties seem to be under assault. You know, things that we've been used to in this country since its founding, you know, like freedom of expression, uh, you know, being able to say what you one, you know, without violence, or of course, or anything like that. But the so-called cancel culture that we have seems to be gearing up. You know, I'm not a social media user, but you know, if, if you are, uh, I'm sure you've heard. You know, there's some things you just can't put on there. You know, things that would seem fairly innocuous, but you know, you will get canceled for saying some things. You know, um, and that list of things seems to be increasing <clears throat> so you know when you think about it, maybe the forecast for this year is not quite so good after all um, mm -hmm. I certainly hope that it is not so good from a worldly perspective I should say but as Christians we have to press onward in our faith regardless of the challenging times that we live in circumstances that we see developing before our very eyes and remain focused on our goal of heaven and of serving Christ and that's what I want to talk about today just pressing onward in our faith you know despite challenging circumstances that we may be faced with you know Paul wrote in the book of Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12 he said, not that I have already attained. You know, in other words, he, he, he's saying there at this point, he says, I know I'm not where I need to be yet. You know, I know that I haven't reached the goal. Continuing on in the verse, he said, or am already perfected. So he knew he was still in the flesh, still subject to what this world could throw at him. <clears throat> He said, but I press on. Now think about the attitude that is uh, displayed in just that simple statement. The determination. You know, the persistence. Come what may out here, you know. 
in the world or whatever is in front of me. I press on, he said, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus, Jesus has also laid hold of me. Now to put this in context, Paul's talking about moving from his old life of being a Pharisee. We were familiar with what Paul was. Chief among sinners is what he called himself, right? Because he was persecuting the church, persecuting Jesus Christ himself. So he was in the process of moving on from his old life of being a Pharisee to being a Christian. <clears throat> but the same principle applies to everyone, to you and I as well, because you know we have to move on from what we were once before we became a Christian. Not only that, but you know we have to kind of move on from events of the past. You know we've got to move on from that crazy wild year called 2020 that may have left us scarred or kind of bewildered or dazed a little bit. You know. And who knows, maybe even worse events of 2021. We don't know what's coming before us. But whatever it is, we've got to take the attitude of Paul and press onward in our faith. <clears throat> and again, I want to continue on here a little bit with what Paul is saying in verse 13. He said, Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, and notice what he says here. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching those or reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul had a lot of things in his past, right? We all know that. Prior to becoming a Christian, a lot of things he wasn't too proud of. I think we could all say that if we want to be honest with ourselves. We all have things in our past we weren't too proud of. <laughs> things that we wouldn't want to talk about, right? <clears throat> now, Paul could have given in to the human tendency that we have to dwell on those things, to kind of let it be like a ball and chain that he's going to drag around, you know, and slow him down. But... You know, if he did that, is that going to serve him very well as he continues to move forward to fight the good fight of faith? No. Well, same principle applies to us. You know, it doesn't do us any good to dwell on those things, hang on to those things that may be way back in the past that, you know, that we certainly want to bring up. So we don't need to beat up ourselves over things from a sinful past, and just like Paul recognized that he didn't need to do that either. Let those things go. And it also doesn't serve us much to look back at recent things that we may have experienced, say, in the year 2020, you know, because that was kind of a painful year for, for everybody. Because we know that we can't change the past. We know we can't go back and change those events. Nobody's invented a time machine yet that I know of that we can step into, <laughs> you know, and go back and correct all those little bitty things. <clears throat> so we don't have control over that. But what do we have control over? How we will choose to look at today and the days that are to come, right? in spite of the circumstances that we may find ourselves in. You know, we still have the power to choose how we are going to look at those things. So let's focus on the here and now then and make sure that the things that we do are those things that will help us to keep our faith and our trust in God and to serve him because those are the most important things that we can do during our short time on this earth right we may be here for 110 years but that's still a short time isn't it compared to the grand expanse of eternity you know so we're this new year's relatively still young you know we're still in march uh we're just kind of getting warmed up here in 2021 <clears throat> And while it can be done anytime, you know, the flipping of the calendar is an opportune time to 
evaluate ourselves simply because, you know, another new year is a reminder that, well, here we are. You know, we've got another year before us. We're no, it's no doubt going to have its challenges and rewards, but what are we going to do with it? You know, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, he said, examine yourselves. In other words, look at yourselves. Evaluate yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Don't you know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, referring to us as Christians, unless indeed you are disqualified. <clears throat> so if we're going to press onward then in our faith, come what may, despite the circumstances that this world is going to throw at us, there's just a few areas here I want to touch on, okay, that will help us to do that. First one, self-examination, all right? A good place to start in our self-examination is to evaluate our relationship with God. You know, what have you been making your priority? Have you been focused on a fear about COVID? Has that become an overwhelming thing? Or maybe it's politics. You know, we have come out of one of the most controversial elect election cycles in the country's history. Um, well, now there's nothing wrong, of course, with being cautious about COVID and protecting yourself. And, and there's nothing wrong with keeping up with what's going on, you know, in, in the political world. <clears throat> but these things only become a problem for us as Christians if we choose to make them our priority. You know, anything that we put before God and our spiritual walk of faith just ain't good. <laughs> you know, it is it not good? So if your attention and, if your, and your priorities have become sidetracked, and only you know that, it might help you to have the right focus by simply going back to the cross and thinking about what Jesus endured for you and I there. Paul wrote again in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and in verse 9, he said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. <clears throat> What's he, what does he mean there when he says that Jesus was rich, but he became poor? Well, he's the creator of everything, right? We're his creation. And this physical world, this universe that we exist in, all his. You know, we can't claim it for ourselves. He decided for a moment in time to give all that up, clothe himself in flesh, and allow his own creation to treat him in such a terrible way. So when you think about an immeasurable love like that, you know, I can't think of a human being doing something like that, giving up everything, you know, and letting themselves be treated that way. When you think about an immeasurable love like that, it should make the current concerns and issues of this world seem pretty insignificant, pretty small should yeah you know the love of christ i think sometimes it is really spoken of too lightly when you consider what it involved you know him putting aside everything he had it all master of it all lord of it all and lowered himself to the point that he did to give his life up on the cross why well to glorify the father number one but in the process so that we could be reconciled to the Father through His perfect sacrifice. You know, there's a few verses um, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 that we need to remind ourselves of. <clears throat> it kind of drives this point home. 
Paul wrote in verse 6 there of chapter 5, he said, For when we were still without strength, in other words, we had no way to save ourselves. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who's the ungodly? You and I, right? So for scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, miserable wretches in his sight, clothed in filthy rags, Christ died for us. Much more then, in verse 9, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You know, that's another part that uh, of God's being that uh, sometimes gets overlooked in some places. You know, while God is loving, holy, and just, he also has wrath toward what? Sin. Yeah. And those who commit sin. <clears throat> That's why Jesus had to come in the first place. He said in verse 10, he said, For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. <clears throat> so sometimes I think, you know, we can get in a little bit of a rut and it can become easy for us to really not fully appreciate what Jesus went through and what it took for him to do this for us. You know, the beating, the scourging, the mocking, the ridiculing. Mm -hmm. All that that took place, that was just as almost as bad as, you know, the actual being nailed to the cross. And of course, you know, the mocking and ridiculing continued there. But the more that we can truly appreciate what he did for us, I think the easier it will be for us to be motivated to live for him and stay focused on our eternal home. <clears throat> Another area where we can, um, you know, work on a little bit as we continue to press onward in our faith is, is actually striving to increase our faith. You know, is increasing your faith a priority for you? What do you give your attention to? You know, we only have so much attention to give in a day, right? The world will love to keep you distracted so that all of your attention is used up. Well, another day's gone by, you know. I, I meant to study a little bit in God's Word, but oh God, I just didn't get to it. I'll do it tomorrow. I meant to, you know, have a little time in prayer no, I just didn't get to it again, you know. I'll, I'll do that tomorrow. <clears throat> Increasing our faith also involves the proper application of our attention. Again, what's your priority? What do you choose to give your attention to? You know, if your attention is used correctly from a spiritual sense, that means spending a little time reading, studying, and applying, you know, what it is that we read in Scripture, in God's Word. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, he said, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So this verse tells us that it's God's Word that is the foundation of our faith. If you are striving to increase your faith, then where are you going to go? To God's Word, to the foundation. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is, and this is a very powerful statement, the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. In other words, he's saying for the Jew first and then for the Gentiles as well. Everybody else. Do you ever stop to realize how fortunate, you know, that we are because we have the privilege of having access to everything that we need to know of 
about having faith in God right here, we have access to that. Paul told Timothy, and this is one of my favorite verses in 2 Timothy 3.16, he said, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. What's that mean? God breathed, came from him. Of course, men wrote it down as they were inspired. <clears throat> and he goes on to say that this God-breathed scripture is profitable. In other words, it's going to do you some good, <laughs> you know, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God, we could say woman of God too, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, this teaches us that our faith in God isn't simply based on a feeling or our imagination because our faith is and it must be grounded in what? The Word of God, right? You know, our feelings can be deceptive. I think we've all been around long enough to realize that, Amen. haven't we? There's, there are those that will say, well, you know, I feel like I'm okay with God. Well, all right, does God's Word back up your feeling? that you have that's the question a faith based on our feeling that God is pleased with us isn't the faith that he intends for us to have if it's not based on his word okay it's got to be based on his word <clears throat> you know I think Jesus made that pretty clear to us in Matthew chapter 7 of verse 21 very famous passage here I think that we're all familiar with not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You know, many that day are going to say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name and we've cast out demons in your name and we've done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness. <clears throat> As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5, he says there's only one faith that's pleasing to God, and that's an obedient faith. Yeah. What does an obedient faith mean? Well, that is a faith backed up by your actions, right? What you do. You know, Jesus just told us if we give him lip service and lip service only, he ain't going to know us, is he? Yeah. <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 11 to verse 6, he said, but without faith, and again we're talking obedient faith, not just belief, but obedient faith, <clears throat> it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What's the action word in that, the last part of that sentence? Seek. Seek him, right? Notice he said here, he only rewards those who diligently seek him. And as you read this entire chapter in Hebrews, you know, it, it'll give you example after example of those who had an obedient faith. In other words, you know, they were taking action. It's more than just lip service. They were following God's word. Same still true for us today. You know, when we allow our lives to be shaped by God's beautiful word, then we're going to have that kind of faith that we need to have, an obedient faith, one that seeks him. And that's going to help us press on in our goal toward heaven. Another area that we can look at and work on is becoming a better servant for the Lord. And this is another component of pressing onward. You know, I think we could all say we could always work on uh, being a better servant for the Lord. <clears throat> but we need to recognize first that it's easy to let the circumstances of life kind of put a damper on our spiritual fire, 
Sometimes it can throw like a wet blanket on there, you know, if we're not careful. But if we allow life to knock us around, and it's going to try, we know that. Before we know it, our fire is going to go out and our love for serving God could grow cold if we're not diligent. That's what Satan's hoping for. Yeah, he's just rubbing his hands together. Yeah, I'm going to throw something else at him. Let's see what they do with that. <clears throat> but every time life knocks us around a little bit, Satan is taking opportunities to try to lure us away from God. Now, the world he's got, he's already got them. Doesn't have to put a lot of effort into them, right? But those of us who have proclaimed Christ become Christians trying to live an obedient, faithful life. He would love to pluck us away, wouldn't he? Pull us back into the muck and the mire. <clears throat> That's why it's important that we follow the advice that Paul wrote to the Ephesians in, in chapter 6 and in verse 10. He said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. And of course, entire series can be um, given about putting on the whole armor of God. And we won't be able to do that here today. But when we put on the whole armor of God, <clears throat> Satan has no power over us because... We've studied our enemy. We know what kind of devices he uses. And having that kind of knowledge gives us an upper hand, right? <clears throat> when we have that whole armor of God, you know, the, uh, the, the faith, uh, I can't remember exactly how the rest of the verse goes there, but the sword and the shield, you know, a picture of the Roman soldier He's got the helmet, he's got the sword and the shield um, and the right kind of shoes for battle. When we have all those things, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know? and so if we're not in the Word, if we are not consuming that, digesting his word, applying it to our lives, how are we going to know our adversary and recognize when he is shooting at us those fiery darts of temptation, sin, and other things? <clears throat> Another area that, uh, or that is a component of pressing onward in our faith is the subject of, of love. And again, this is one of those subjects that could be talked about for many, 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 many lessons. But one of the most important qualities that we should possess as Christians and continue to work on is love. <clears throat> Paul recognized this and he tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, going down through about verse 3. He's telling us how important it is here. He says, though I, speak of, or though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. In other words, he's saying, I'm just making noise, <laughs> you know, if I'm not speaking based in love. In his second verse, he says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love. He says, I'm nothing. In verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. He's talking about a lot of great works there and great abilities to do a lot of wonderful things, right? But he says, from the Christian standpoint, in the end, if he's doing all those things not based in love, what is it really going to profit him? <clears throat> if he doesn't have the proper motivation. But without love, you, you know, you can never really have the kind of passion for serving God that he wants you to have. I, I, I think that's what Paul was trying to tell us here. 
people can do all kinds of wonderful things. And we see people in the world out there that will do all kinds of wonderful things. But what does it profit them from a spiritual standpoint? Uh, Another aspect of serving God and, and having that based in love is and the question to ask yourself, I suppose, would be, you know, do we serve God just on the first day of the week when we assemble? You know. <clears throat> Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said, if anyone desires to come after me, in other words, think back to a verse verse that we read a little bit earlier, diligently seek, you yeah. Kind of the same thing. If anyone desires to come after me, diligently seek me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The main point here is that Jesus is trying to get us to understand that serving God is a daily event. You know, not just when we assemble here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or if it's in the morning uh, at another congregation. But Jesus is saying that we, and you know, we're in the flesh and we're going to be tempted, of course, but that we should never grow weary of doing good or grow weary in increasing our knowledge of God's Word. Because if we're not growing, then what's the opposite of that? We're becoming complacent, you know, standing still, you know, which isn't a good thing. You know, whether you're 19, or 90, we still have the obligation to challenge ourselves to grow, become wiser in God's Word and in living the Christian life. Why? Well, because it will help to keep your spiritual flame from growing dim, going out. Again, you know, Paul wrote so much good advice for us here. Um, on this subject in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. He said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. <clears throat> and John wrote in, in, over in the book of Revelation <clears throat> and Why is it that our labor is not in vain? Well, here's why. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, he said, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Are we all going to be in that category at some point? Yes. If we remain faithful. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. You know, when you look at these two verses and add them together, it should be clear that our work doesn't come to an end here in this world until we're either not physically or mentally capable or we die and leave this world. Notice that Paul says that a Christian is always to abound in the work of the Lord. It doesn't mean, you know, like when you get 72 or 67, you don't get to take a... Take a vacation, you get to retire, right? Start drawing that Social Security. Oh, well, I guess I'll retire from working as a Christian too. Eh, wrong. <clears throat> but John continues to thought that saying that after a Christian dies, leaves this world, that's when they get the rest from their labors. And that's a blessed thought to think about. Yeah. yeah. This world's full of labor. Some of it's not too pleasant. <laughs> a lot of it's not too pleasant, really. <clears throat> but there is a time coming then that we get the rest from it. Another component of pressing onward in our faith is, you know, enduring hardships. Okay. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus, we see Jesus here that he was getting ready to send out his disciples on this small mission. And he was giving them a warning about what was going to happen to them. 
So in other words, you know, he is trying to mentally prepare them. You know, get your heads wrapped around this, in other words. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, here's where he really kind of dropped the hammer on them. I'm sure it was a lot for them to digest at the moment. But Jesus told them, he said, now look, you're all going to be hated for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And I can kind of imagine the, you know, the shock on their faces you know, when Jesus told them that. You mean we've got to go out and do this and we're going to be hated, we're going to be resisted? You know, people are going to talk bad about us, may throw rocks at us, may try to throw us in jail. Jesus said, but those who endure to the end will be saved. <clears throat> well, are we any better than those apostles and disciples that Jesus was sending out? No. As Christians, are we going to endure hardships in this fallen world that we live in? Better believe it. Something we've got to wrap our heads around. Right? We're not promised a primrose path that we'll get to walk the rest of our days. Not here in this world. But the way to endure all the hardships and all the temptations of this life that it's going to throw at us is by keeping our focus on Jesus and remaining faithful to Him. Jesus said in Revelation 2.10, he said, those that who endure to the end will be saved and they will receive a crown of righteousness. In order for us to remain faithful like that and not lose our desire to serve the Lord, you know, it, it takes an inward determination. You know, remember at the beginning of the lesson, Paul talked about how he hadn't attained he wasn't perfected yet, but he was going to keep moving on, right? You could hear the determination that in that statement. So if you don't ever convince yourself of how important it is, you know, to love God with all your heart and your mind and your soul, that's developing that determination, then how are you ever going to be able to press forward? especially when you meet resistance. And resistance is going to come. And besides, if we're not living for Jesus, then how is anybody else going to be able to see Christ in us? Isn't that the reason we're still here? As you've heard Sammy say many times, it'd be great if the moment we came up out of that watery grave of baptism, we could have just gone on, right? But no, God has a purpose for those of us who are Christians to be a light to lead others mm -hmm. to Christ. <clears throat> Final motivation I want to leave you with uh, when it comes to pressing onward is that we all need to remember that there is a judgment day coming. God's Word tells us of that. And we'll either be judged by our own deeds, what we've done, or we'll be judged by the righteousness of Christ that will be imputed to us if we have been faithful to the end. Which one do you want to be judged by? <laughs> Lord, don't look at the things I've done. <laughs> I don't have a leg to stand on. Nobody else does either. Please look at Christ when you look at me. <laughs> so ask yourself, are you ready for that judgment day? We don't know if we'll live to see it, but it, we will participate in it. <clears throat> but we know clearly that when we read God's Word and study the Bible, we know that it says that Jesus will come back, put an end to this world, 
And when he does, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the end of the fallen world here. And then that judgment day is going to come. And he tells us that in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, he said, but that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, also will the coming of the Son of Man be. <clears throat> And of course, we know, you know, if you've read back in Genesis, you know what the days of Noah were like. They were just all going about having a good old time, doing the regular routines, partying and getting together and doing all this and that. And of course, there's a lot of evil. Evil was on the increase back then, right? Mm -hmm. Exceedingly evil. They didn't think they was ever going to pay a price. <clears throat> and so, you know, the scripture says here, or Jesus said, you know, in verse 38, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until that day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So it came as a complete surprise to those who weren't prepared. Yeah, to those who weren't ready. Jesus said, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Skipping down to verse 44 in this chapter 24. <clears throat> Here's the meat of the matter. Therefore you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Yeah. I like how Peter puts it in Second Peter chapter 3 and in verse 9. He said, the Lord is a slack concerning his promise, as some would count slackness. You know, a lot of us think, why hadn't, why hadn't the Lord put an end to all this foolishness and craziness already? Well, because he has a patience and a long suffering that we can't understand as humans in the flesh. He wants everybody to come to repentance that's going to. But it says he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. <clears throat> and Peter backs up what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 24 here in verse 10. He says, But the day the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with a fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So everything we see around here, temporary. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. They put their faith in these things that we have. Yeah. In verse 11, Peter said, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, in other words, when you finally realize, <laughs> when you get it through your thick head, that all this stuff's temporary, then what manner of persons ought you to be with that knowledge in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening for the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with the fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, those who are Christians living and obedient faith, According to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. <clears throat> Therefore, beloved, look, looking forward to these things, be diligent. There's that word diligent again. <laughs> Action, you know. <clears throat> Determined. Persistent. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. So Jesus could come today, this afternoon, or it could be a thousand years from now. But what's important here, according to these verses that we've just looked at, is that we live our lives in such a way that we're always ready for his return or to go to him when we lay these physical bodies down. We don't know which will come first. So... If you're living your life in a way that you're prepared for that judgment day or to go to Him, what a glorious day that will be. But if not, 
It will be the first day of eternity spent in torment and separation from God, mm -hmm. suffering His wrath, which is part of His nature because He hates sin. So each new day that we see then gives us the opportunity to change our ways where they need to be changed, gives us the opportunity to recommit ourselves to following Jesus and His Word. And when we use God's Word as our guide, it's our foundation. Remember, we read that verse earlier. And we live by it. There isn't going to be any surprises for us as Christians when that glorious day comes. Because we'll be judged on what? Not our own deeds. <laughs> Last thing we want, right? We'll be judged on the righteousness of Christ. Clothed in His righteousness. For those that are found outside the body of Christ at that time, Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 48, said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. In other words, they'll be, they'll take God's word, take their deeds, compare them, see how it matches up. We we'll talk about falling short. Ooh, scary thought. Scary thought. So as the old saying goes, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Amen. You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. So I hope the words that I brought out today can be of some help to us all as we continue to press onward toward our heavenly home. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate your attendance here today and your attention. And uh, if anyone would like uh, prayers of the church for anything, just make those needs known as we stand and sing the song. It's like.